Welcome everybody to episode 6 of our video tutorials about creating a complete app builder with Vine. Hopefully you've learned a lot through the previous videos. If you've missed any, do go back and watch them on the playlist. There's a few great tips already covered. But today I'm moving on to a new concept, something that's not in the basic Vine toolkit, and that is saving a user interface to a file. It is, of course, a key aspect of any user interface designer, so it's exciting to start work on this functionality. We are going to start by importing a library that provides some of that functionality, and we're going to write some unit tests that help us to verify that that's working correctly and explore a little bit Fine's capabilities for unit testing. So let's just jump right back into the code. If you've been following along, you might notice there's a couple of changes since episode five. As I proposed during the video, I went back and improved the editing, the editor error handling. And so instead of returning the error text inside a label that's then displayed uh, and presented to the user like it's valid content, these errors are being propagated up. So each of the function handlers that we wrote returns an error and the for URI is passing that out to the user interface so that it could do smarter things like displaying an error pop-up um, or um, making sure that files don't become highlighted when really there was an, actually an issue with opening them. You can see the changes that were made if you follow along on the project's GitHub page. It's Fine Labs Fission Tutorials and you can see the project here and if you look through the commit log you'll see episode commits and the items in between them as well. Anyhow, let's move on and have a look at the library that we're going to be importing for the work today. It's called Define. It helps to work with Fine UI in a programmatic way, as well as some other functionality. But what we're really interested in is this GUI package that is exposed that allows us to work with graphical files. So first of all, we're going to want to import that into our project. So we'll open up a terminal and we will get it using go get like we've done before. So this time it's go get github.com and then find uh, IO for the project home space and then define for the project. And we're going to be using the uh, GUI package at latest and that will grab the code and set it up in our project. Uh, I think unfortunately we, we, this shouldn't really have happened here. Um, it's changed the version of fine which I think has just resulted in an error. Yeah because we're using unreleased functionality this is going to be a bit of a problem. The two seem to be conflicting. Um, let me just put a little workaround into our go.mod. This is something that you might need to do yourself if you're working with um, unreleased versions of any library, I suppose. You can see here it's, it's downgraded it to a release that it thinks is, is more recent. Um, so we'll probably, I think the best or easiest thing is just to replace that um, so I can say find.io find v2 should be replaced by um, a local copy of the library that I have. Um, well, let me just guess where it is. I think that guess should be correct. Um, and then let's see if we run that again. Then I think, yes, there we go. The error has gone away, the import succeeded. So I think we can go ahead with our work here. So that's the library imported. Um, we want to now work with that to open and save files. Um, but I thought this would be a good opportunity to look at unit testing, like I said at the beginning. So the work we do today is going to be in the editors folder and I'm going to create a new GUI editor. Uh, but let's just start with a unit test. So it's just a regular go test um, package is editors. 
and we're going to write it just like any other. So uh, let's call it um, a Siri. Uh, <laughs> I can't spell today. Test Siri allies. And we pass it testing.t. That, if we save, creates a unit test. And in here, we're going to start working with that library that I just imported. It's really quite straightforward, actually. It just has an encode and decode method. So we're going to test the serialize, which is encoding. Actually, let me just type it as encode. That's probably going to be a bit easier. So we want to test what happens when we um, encode uh, an object. I suppose that's a good start. So um, let's just set up a new label. New label. And we'll say testing. That is our label. And now we're going to try encoding it. So we can call encode. Uh, and it's encoding to JSON. This is going to take the object that we want to encode, some metadata about the object, which we can just ignore at the moment, and a writer to place it to. So let's see if we can do L and nil and the writer we haven't created. With uh, unit testing, it could be help helpful to have a test data folder where you can read and write files, um, but we don't actually need anything right now. We could use an in-memory um, buffer. So if we set up bytes.buffer, um, then that should allow us to uh, work in memory only. And that's going to want a new byte buffer, which we're going to want to use to compare the results later. So um, bytes.buffer. And I think that needs to be one of those pointer types. Um, oh, no, sorry, that's not quite right. It is a, um, it's the bytes themselves that it wants to be passed in. So we're then going to encode our label here to JSON and pass it out to the writer. Um, I'm not entirely sure what we're going to compare it to right now. Um, so let's just print it out. Uh, actually, let's, let's, I suppose, quickly, um, we could check that it's not empty. Yeah. So the uh, JSON is going to be the string representation of that buffer. Oh, we can actually just get the byte. We, we have the buffer already, silly. So we can assert not empty the um, JSON. Uh, is that right? Yep. And then we could just log it. Uh, let's just dump it to screen. So we can run this test just as it is, a, a regular unit test, and it's, it's going to fail. Ah, yes, that nil map is not okay. You can't have nil metadata. We can have empty metadata, but not nil. Um, I might just open a bug report on the library there, but for now we can set that up and make a map. And so, as you might guess, this metadata here is describing a map of string key to value. That is itself each a value of a map where canvas object is the key. So we're storing essentially unspecific metadata about any object that's being used. That will come in useful later, um, but perhaps we can ignore it for today. Ah. The encoded output was empty. I think, judging by the output here, we should probably have started a fine app to be able to do some of these things. Let's try that. So there is a test helper, like I said, in fine. So we can do new app. And that is going to create a new app in memory that doesn't need to display anything to screen. And we can use that to run through our unit testing. It's still empty, this time with no error. 
Um, let's see what's going on. Encode JSON. Let's examine the error which was missed earlier. So we want that error to be nil. I suspect that is going to fail. So if we run the test again, it should print out what the error was. No, we have no error. We just have no JSON returned. Um, that's very strange. Maybe I misused the buffer here. Ah, yes, sorry. Of course, we can just get the string from the buffer. Uh, that feels like it's probably going to be better. There we go. So this byte buffer, um, I think what I did, I created it and it was being copied through memory. Um, perhaps, can we pass nil as the buffer? I think that might work. There we go. So we have a non-empty JSON, but it's not printing out anymore. So that we need to run as um, verbose or perhaps the debug test will help us there. Ah, there we go. So we've got now the complete output of our test, which is usually hidden if the test passes, which seems like a good idea. Now that's the log header. This is the content of our JSON. So I'm going to just copy that in here. I'll call it label JSON. Um, yeah, as a raw string. And you can see what's happened here. We have the label is the type of widget. This opens a single widget. And um, the information about how it is set up is here. Some of it will make sense, some of it's not important, but the text that we passed in is here, testing. So if we were to then assert that they are the same, so we can assert equal that the um, label JSON, which is what we want, is the same as the JSON that we get. Well, let's hope that that succeeds because we just copied one from the other. Um, ooh. Right, yes, the indenting is off. That pasting in has changed the string indentation. The spaces are okay there, but not there. Oh, that's that's unfortunate. It's correct at the top level, except it shouldn't have shouldn't have space. I'm sure that somebody more experienced with VS Code will be able to tell me what we did wrong there. tedious, most tedious part of what we've done so far, but just bear with me. We'll get this corrected. Try not to make any errors. And yep, yeah, it didn't correct me, so hopefully that sorted it. Oh, I got one wrong. I got one wrong. There should be, I think, a new line when we pasted it in. I missed that new line. I'll just run that one more time. And the test is passing. Um, excellent. Oh, let's just lose that. There we go. So this is the JSON that we expect, and we are getting it back. Now, just to validate, of course, we could change our core test data, and then run our test, and we'll see it's failing. Always nice to have a failing test that you can resolve. In this case, it was a bit of a workaround. And if we run that one more time, then it will be correct matching because we specified the text in our constructor. That's interesting enough, I suppose. It's showed us that we can encode our widget into JSON, um, but there's probably more interesting things that we can do um, by taking it around the other way. So we will try to test the decoding and we'll work with this JSON that has been created and see that we can get back the object we expect so let's create a new a new function here. T 
test decode and open this up. So once again, we'll create a new app. We don't need to do anything with that app. It's just setting the test infrastructure to be correct. And this time around, we're going to use the decode. So we'll ask the GUI library to decode the JSON, which we have already created in that label um, string. And this is going to um, take a reader, uh, not a text string, so we need to fix that. And it will return an object and also the um, map of uh, metadata, which again, we can actually just ignore for now. So um, that will be um, ignore the metadata, save what we're hoping is a label. And instead of the string, we're looking for a reader, new reader from the label JSON. Well, that, that, that's quite neat. And then we're wanting to make some assertions. So uh, let's just check then that it's not nil. Not nil. Um, the label. Oh, for anybody not familiar um, with this assert library, I mean, you absolutely should be. It's so useful. It's the uh, testify library. And we just have to pass the test context into each of the parameters. Uh, and then any additional parameters for the, the function that you might need. So it's not nil. And then we're going to uh, do a, um, a type assertion to say this object is a label. So in fact, let's take that back from being L for label and make it an object, generic canvas object, which is what could be returned. And then we'll ask it if it's a label by saying um, object dot widget dot label. And then that is going to perform the type assertion in Go code. And then for the test harness, we can just use the true check so that we know the type assertion passed. Now we know we have a label. So we'll do one more assertion and that will be sorry, dot equals the let's check the test of the label, which should, should be welcome um, like we set up before. And that would be L dot text, the text of the label widget. So if our serializer, our decoder uh, and encoder are all working together, then this test should just pass, which it does. Excellent. So now we know that in memory, we have our widget, but it would be reasonable to say, mm, but I can't see anything. How do we know that it's working correctly or that it fully loaded? Well, for this, we can use another fine test assistant and that is, we can check that a widget in memory can be rendered or does render as we would expect. So we can assert that an object renders to an image or to markup. So let's go with the image first. It's nice and visual. It expects a file name. So I'm going to reference the test data uh, directory that I mentioned before and call it label.png. And then it's going to ask us for the object, the canvas object there. So we're going to say the label um, should render to the contents of label.png. Well, of course, that doesn't exist. And it's quite difficult to create an image of how we want our label to look. So this image test is going to fail. But inside the folder we asked it to place the file into, it has created a failed um, directory, a subdirectory called failed. And our label is what was rendered. Well, that is quite convincing. And I can take this and put it into our test data folder. And this becomes the gold master. And so if we go back to um, GUI test and run it once more, oh, Oh, that's the wrong test, sorry. Uh, I don't know why I opened there. Ah, okay, I think I have typed something wrong. Ah, yes, 
the test data is actually assumed um, by the Affine testing utilities. So I can remove that um, and take out the failed directory, which we won't need anymore. Move that to trash. We have our test data label. And let's try one more time. And there we go. It is now able to verify that our label looks like this if we ask it to render. You'll notice there's no windows on screen. It hasn't put anything visually on our computer screen, but we are able to check that it renders just by saving the contents of the memory into a PNG file. Now, of course, that's very powerful from a human point of view, but it can be challenging if you like to tweak themes, colors, and sizes, because each time you do that, all of your image-based tests are going to fail because they all changed, even if it's very subtly. So for this reason, we have included another one that you'll potentially find more beneficial, and that is to say that it renders to markup. And this is writing to an XML markup. So we can do exactly the same process. We'll run our test, and the test is going to fail because the XML file wasn't there. If we look at this, it's generated the XML again, and this time it's describing the image, and that is to say, this is how big it is, it has some content, the widget is that same size, and it is a label. It has some text inside it with this size, and that is the text. So we can put that into our test data folder as well, and I suppose we could remove that failed directory and run those tests one more time. And uh, it has passed. Excellent. OK. So we've managed to take uh, from JSON a graphical object, verified that it draws correctly. Um, also, we have verified that a graphical object can be persisted using this library. I don't know why that test failed, though. Let's just see what was going on there. Oh, just, just a rendering glitch, perhaps. OK, so I think we're well set up now. We've, we've checked the dependencies are functioning as we want, and we are ready to add an editor for our user interface file. So like the extension-based um, additions that we made last time, I'm going to ask it to understand a new type of file. Um, I'm going to call this a GUI JSON file. Uh, should be relatively unique. Um, it's going to have to go under extensions because there's no official MIME type for this thing that I just made up. And then we're going to want to create this new function. I'll just copy one that we have here, make go, and put this in a new file. It's going to be a little bit larger than some of the others. Um, that'll be go. So that's our function. Um, we just need to correct the name so it doesn't collide and the imports. Excellent. OK. So we are going to want to output the canvas object visual and uh, any error that occurs from the given URI. Our library is taking a reader. So we're going to be able to make use of the storage package one more time. And if I just say that, the import should work. Uh, oops. Mm, I think we're going to need to give it a hint. So if I just manually import um, the find storage package. Oh, it went away. Goodness me, that's frustrating. Uh, and now, there you go. It can suggest the reader we're able to pass the reader a URI, and we're going to need to just check for errors again. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I added this error handling in from um, where we were last week. So if um, there was an error, if that error is not nil, we're going to just want to return that straight away. So we have nothing to display, but we have an error to return. Yep, and now we have a reader. We can go ahead and utilize that with our um, decode. 
So it's going to decode the JSON from the reader. That's going to return the canvas object and a map that we're not too concerned about. And from here, we can, um, at the basic level, just return that object with a nil error. Okay, well, I mean, that's loaded uh, a user interface editor from the file that we had available. We check that these things should work using some tests and the editor has it hooked in here. So I suppose the next thing it would be helpful to do is to make sure that there is a, a user interface file in any new project that we create. If we go back to the project.go, we had a function create project and that put a go module into the current directory. And then, uh, oh yes, and then returned the directory that was the place where the project was stored. So we can basically copy a little copying here, probably refactor that out into a function in a moment. And instead of mod, let's call it JSON. Um, and let's just refer to this as main.gui.json for now. If there's an error, we return. We open a writer, there's no new variables here. And that's going to the JSON file. And in here, we want to write a different text. What will we put in here? Well, let's just for now take this JSON here. We have the contents of what one of those files should look like. So we can drop that in. And that goes there. Um, oh, it's, mm, it's done something strange with the import indentation. Oh, I just undid the paste. It would appear the paste was done in two stages, paste and indent. Uh, by undoing just one of them, the indentation is back where I thought it should be. Very useful. Before we pass the name of the um, module into the uh, module file here, we could do something similar. So instead of just the word welcome, we can put the module name in there so that the text of the new user interface file label includes our project name. That'd be a nice touch. So now when we create a new project, it's going to write out this additional file. And when we open the project, that file um, should uh, display or be, be, be openable. Um, let me see, what, what did I mess up here? Um, the value of error is never used. Ah, yes, the error is returned here. So we need one more um, error check, really, um, just after that. That, I think, yep, yeah, that's the warning gone away. So let's um, go and run this again. Hi, <laughs> go run. And this time round, let's create a new project and see what happens. Um, I'll just pop it in my home directory. Example, I think, are we on three now? Um, that should be okay. So we're opening up, we see a go mod and a JSON file. This is the preview that we um, left in there from when we were working before. And if I tap this JSON, it couldn't find main.gui.json, an editor to match. Main.gui.json, ah, right, okay. So I think this might be because JSON is the extension. Mm. So we've included two extensions there. I suspect our comparison, this here is, um, is going to trim that off. Um, let's just skip by that for now and I'll come back to it. Um, so we'll just open that project. There we go. And there we go. It has loaded that JSON file and it's created the label welcome example three and example three is the name of the project so that's worked nicely of course it doesn't match this preview though does it
So let's just see what we can do about that. The preview, I think, came from our GUI file. And the uh, preview was the name of the tab. So this content is what created the preview. So what are we going to want from here? The um, item here, the picker and the window, that chunk of code there, I think created our preview. So if we just take that for a moment and go to our um, file here, we have our object, but instead of returning this, we're going to want to build the window preview um, around the um, content we have. So we'll return the content here. The object is the content, so um, we don't need this new label. We will pass that here. And the G title, and that's the title of the project loaded in the GUI. Um, so we're missing a little context here. Um, so realistically, we should we could pass it in here. Um, so when we call this function, it needs to know the um, the user interface context, doesn't it? Let's extend that here. Um, I suppose, yeah. I mean, let's just pass it as an extra parameter for now. I think is that is that going to make sense? Uh, what are we passing around this user interface object? Well, it's private. Um, I think this might be an item to come back to. So I'm going to make a note here. The reason I'm not going to do this right now is because we could insert the user interface um, information here. We could expose it or we could pass a subset of it. But realistically, this um, function is interested in the project that's loaded. So really what we want is the project metadata, not the entire user interface. That would be a better separation of concerns as well, but we don't have a separate project description yet. Um, type when we add it. And so I'll come back to that. I'll um, leave that there and just call the window title preview for now. Apologies if that seems a little bit dirty. Hopefully you can see though um, how this kind of follows the process of understanding where the separation of um, concerns are. The rest of it remains. What we need to do is go back to our um, user interface code where we copied this from. And I don't think really any of that is needed anymore. We don't have a preview. In fact, you know, we don't really want one. Instead, what we've got is a home page, something that would be displayed if we don't have any tabs open. So we need some new content. Um, uh, let's put something vaguely rich <laughs> with a little bit of semantic meaning um, in here. Again, a raw string will just say, um, welcome to Fission. Please, uh, please open a file from the tree. That will probably work for now. And if we go ahead and run this again, then we should, <laughs> okay, that's premature. The background probably would change um, when whether we have the project open or not. Um, but for now, we can open that project one more time. And that file then opens up here. So we have our welcome example three loaded from the file into our preview window, uh, which we set up earlier. Uh, cool, that's um, 
that's got us that's got us all the way through oh, I'm, I'm quite I'm quite excited that that um, that all came together let me just think um, I would say that that's probably achieved what I wanted to today uh, but somebody wrote in on a previous video and pointed out that there is uh, one thing that we left out on the um, multiple file handling in the previous video these are just file names well home isn't but the rest of them are just file names and what happens if you have two files with the same name in a project well let's just have a look uh, oh sorry I see an error in the console we didn't use new app with ID um, for the preferences I'm not too worried about that yet we're just working through some some demo code um, in example 3 we have a go.mod a main.create.json so let's just put two W files in there, test.txt, um, test1 goes into that file, and let's make a new directory uh, in example 3 called more, and we'll dump something similar into that file, test2. Uh, so if I just list what's in that uh, in the example 3 we now have a go mod a more folder with test.txt a test.txt at the top level and the JSON file that we were just working with so if we go and um, open that let's run this and um, just pass the example 3 folder um, as the parameter and it's going to open it right away we'll open test.txt1 and then when we open test.txt2 we will see a new file because they have unique URIs but the content and the content is unique different but the title is the same one thing you might notice is as we change it the tree is selecting the file that was open I was just another small change I made between videos which I thought helped to understand where we were working so almost solve the problem of which file am I working with but let's assume that that is a long tree or you've got it partially hidden it would be nice to show uniqueness in this tab bar so how can we go about doing that well let's go let's let's go do it when we open a file we are um, opening a tab uh, oh, that's sorry. Yes, we're remembering which tabs we have open so that we can um, reopen the same file if we click it twice. We're then append appending a new item and selecting it. And that item's name is specified here by the um, simple URI name. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty straightforward, but we're getting a, a small conflict here. So, what can we do about it? Well, it's yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I, I think what we can do is just iterate through the tabs and fix the naming if we find that there is a problem. So we can simplify the challenge slightly for just opening. Let's assume for now that we only need to check for these naming collisions when we open a file and we'll see whether an existing file uh, an existing tab has the same title so we can we can use a range there um, so we can have a tab we don't I don't think it matters what the idea is I will range through um, the content tabs uh, oh, I forgot the comma uh, items and if the um, tab text is not equal to this name let's just avoid calling that a whole bunch of times and put it here as a new variable so if the names are different continue not a problem at all if the names are the same then we're going to need to update um, the tab title to include the directory now 
I don't think we're going to need to worry about whether this is the current tab or an old tab because we're iterating through them all and we've already added ours so we will find ourselves, and it will match he says um, realizing the flaw in what we've done here we actually don't want to append it yet because we will always match on our own content so if we do this before we um, add it then if any of them match us we can fix it and fix ourselves. And we, I don't think we need to worry about doing that multiple times because assuming this always runs, we will only ever find one match for our name because there should be no duplicates in there. Okay, so, sorry, rambling a little bit, but it means we can fix the tab we found, fix ourselves, and then we're done. So <laughs> I'll just kind of write this, write this down. Um, And then we can break from the loop and fix item. It should be tab, sorry. And ourself is item. So we can fix the tab. Um, let's get the uh, directory name of the current item, I think. Um, we're going to need to find the URI that that tab represents. Okay, that's that's fine, but we're going to have to iterate again, um, which I think we have already done um, in open tabs. Oh, no, we just did a simple lookup before. Okay, so for each of the open tabs, uh, we need to find the tab item that we have. No, we don't have to do that. Um, we have the index. No, it's a map on a list. Sorry. Um, for each of the um, children in the open tabs, we need to check. So if the um, uh, tab index, oh no, that's the URI, um, URI to item. I got this wrong way around, sorry. URI name oh no we can just check if the child is in fact the tab that we're comparing against we know what to do um, in fact reverse this continue uh, now we know that we're working on the current tab so the URI that we have here is the one that we care about. So the directory would be the URI, what can we get from here? Well, we have the name, but that's what we're working with already. The path, um, that could be used if we were to assume it's a file. Um, but I don't want to make that assumption. So instead, I'm going to use the storage package once more and ask for the parent of a URI, which is this URI. So parent is what we find. Um, if the error is not nil, mm, what would we do here? I'm going to ignore it because the parent of our URI, it's going to be valid, I'm pretty certain. Um, so we have the um, parent. So then the file name of the parent will be then the name of the directory, so that's just parent.name, which means that we can um, I'll probably skip that step. Tab.text uh, is instead the parent.name plus the tab.name. Um, tab.text, sorry. Uh, yes, that's correct, we're prepending. Um, let's just put a, a slash in there as well. Um, uh, let's use the um, uh, separator so that it will put the operating system appropriate um, text character for separating file paths. Um, 
that's ah uh, yes. Oh, it's a room. Sorry. So uh, let's just. I can't remember how to do this effectively, actually, sorry. I'll probably come back to this with a little more time and tidy it up. But we're making a new string from a single rune um, and putting strings on either side. I think printf would be better, but I can't off the top of my head remember the uh, character that we use to represent a rune in a string formatter. Um, now this, we're going to want to, uh, to do again but we can do it a little bit simply. To fix ourselves, we don't need to check the tab. Um, we don't need to iterate, sorry. So the storage of R, uh, sorry, the parent of R URI is the parent of, I think we called it U earlier. And instead of tab.txt, it's item.txt. Is the parent or name and then item dot text. Okay. Now this would have been a good thing to unit test, wouldn't it? He says, realizing a little bit too late. Let's just text test it as we go. Text one, text two, and so there we have. This is the second one is inside the more directory, and the original one is in the root directory, which is called example three. Um, I hope that has helped. Thanks so much for your question. And let's just leave that there. Before I go back and look at more unit tests or uh, go over more things, let's just call it a day there. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, don't forget, if you've been enjoying this, do please uh, subscribe to the, the the playlist. You'll get this as next video as soon as it's available. Uh, next week we are going to be looking at um, how to work with theme editing. So hopefully that sounds enjoyable and we'll see you then. In the meantime, don't forget that you can go to fission.app in your browser um, and now you can sign up to be a tester of the app that we are building. You can also um, watch that page for updates on the project uh, and also, if you would like to give any feedback, please do get in touch on the video feed or by heading to the Fine Labs website. It's linked through this article here. Uh, we have a, a contact us at the bottom of the page. Well, have fun exploring and uh, we'll see you back next time. Thank you.